Hi there, I'm Brandi Dickey from the Department of Aging and Disabilities. May was the 50th anniversary of Older Americans Month, and the department held a kickoff event here at the Chesapeake Center for the Arts with Rona Kramer, the Secretary of the Maryland Department of Aging, and Sandy Markwood, the CEO of the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging. After the presentation, we'll speak with Ms. Kramer and Ms. Markwood, but the presentation is about to begin, so let's listen to what they have to say. Is that um, I really applaud you, Brave Souls, and got up and took advantage of a great song. I think it's awesome. Yeah. Welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for your patience. And thank you for being here to join us for the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Older Americans Act. I'm Linda Dennis, and I'm chair of the Anne Arundel County Area Agency on Aging Advisory Council. A big name for a very rewarding job. Uh, I love my volunteer time at Partners, I mean, at uh, Department of Aging, and uh, during the other hours of the week, I'm a site coordinator, coordinator of Partners in Care, and we've been uh, the proud partner of the Department of Aging for over 20 years, so I'm glad to be here today. Um, today's uh, event is an awesome opportunity to recognize the legacies and contributions of our experienced adults. Older Americans are productive, active, influential members of society, sharing essential talents, wisdom, and life experience with their families, friends, and their neighbors. The Older Americans Act focused on the quality of life for older Americans and helped to establish agencies like the Department of Aging and Disabilities to assist and guide older Americans to, be the, to the best quality care that they are entitled to receive. Today we have some important speakers with us to celebrate uh, this special occasion. But before these introductions, I'd like to welcome Pam Jordan, the Director of Van Arundel County Department of Aging and Disabilities, to say a few words. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to this beautiful facility. Uh, Brenda Fraley, who's been in your staff, this beautiful Chesapeake Arts Center. Thank you so much for hosting us. Are you here, Brenda? Linda. Thank you. 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 Members have carried on to this day. And if our advisory council members are in the audience now, could you just please raise your hand or stand if you're able so we can thank you for your partnership for this event today? So we had this 50 years ago, we had this little uh, commission with a few dedicated county employees along with some dedicated volunteers. Um, you fast forward now 50 years. We are now a true aging and disability resource center, thanks to the leadership of our special guests that are here today, serving older adults, people with disabilities, and caregivers through 21 programs in 25 different locations in Anne County every day. 25 locations wow. serving older adults. Population, but we really started burgeoning. You know, it just uh, we didn't have enough resources. Um, we, we later formed the Maryland Commission on Aging in 1982, and that's when we officially became the Anne Arundel County Department of Aging and Disabilities, an aging and disability resource center. <coughs> so I again want to thank all the dedicated staff who put this event together and work very hard every day um, to, to make our department a success. So you know our population is no secret, our population is going to double. Right here in Anne Arundel County, we expect to double the um, number of older adults, people with disabilities, and caregivers that we are serving uh, within the next uh, 15 years. Um, so it's just so important that we have events like this to keep in touch with our community. Now on that note, I'm very pleased to take today as an opportunity to announce that as part of our area plan, we're going to be hosting um, a town hall that's going to be next Monday at 1 o'clock at the Pascal Senior Center. Do we have a Pascal representative? Yes, we do. Um, we're going to be uh, taking it up a notch from technology. 
and uh, we're going to be streaming it to the other senior centers. You'll have an opportunity for email feedback, so we'll get back to you in more details, but if you can mark your calendars for next Wednesday, uh, next Monday, the 11th at 1 o'clock for our town hall. Um, other achievements I'd just like to note is yesterday, um, we opened our Maryland Access Point um, Center, and we are so proud of our new customer service center. Touchscreen interaction, um, uh, counseling rooms, um, dedicated staff. Who was able to attend yesterday at our, um, yeah, there you go. It was beautiful, isn't it? If you haven't had a chance, please stop by uh, down in Annapolis at our heritage site and um, take a tour and see all the new things that, are for, that will serve you as a gateway to resources in partnership with the Department of Health and the uh, Department of Social Services. So I want to thank, um, as I begin to close my remarks, that um, President Lyndon B. Johnson, for his leadership and advocacy in 1965, for having the foresight to create the services and programs that promote health, independence, and support for America's aging population. And I so look forward to our speakers who are going to share more about where we've been and where we're going. So before we do hear from our guest speakers, I want to recognize some um, guests that have joined us, and some of them wasn't able to join us today. Um, Janet Owens, our former county executive and former AAA, AAA director, um, called me this morning and she said his um, greetings and her best. She will try to make it a little bit later, but she was unable to make it for the remarks. Um, she was also the chair of our transition team, so a big supporter of this department. Um, Evola Peters is here, our human relations officer. Welcome, Evola. Cordes is here from the Animal Community College. Dr. Cordes, welcome. And uh, then as um, uh, I close, I want to um, invite Chris Casey, who is representing uh, my boss and our leader of Animal County, um, County Executive Steve Shu, who was unable to make it today. He was with us yesterday to cut the ribbon. But uh, Chris is going to bring us greetings from County Executive Steve Shu. Please welcome Chris to the podium. Good morning, and as uh, Pam was saying, you're stuck with me today. I'm sorry, guys, it's just the way it is. No, but I'm Chris Casey. I'm the constituent service representative for North County. And how appropriate that we're here in Brooklyn Park, where we not only have such a beautiful art center and a thriving community of seniors, but we actually have the highest concentration of seniors out of the entire county, and probably a lot of the state, too. But I don't want to rethank everybody, because Ms. Jordan already did it, but thank you all for being here on behalf of the county executive. And I just want to share with you a quick story. I met a homeless man yesterday who spent 20 years in prison in Georgia, and it, it affected him greatly in, in a bunch of different ways, I'm sure. But I asked him, what was the number one thing you learned over that time? And out of anything he could have said, it was take care of your parents, take care of your grandparents, because they're the ones that gave you life. No one could ever give you anything better than that. Um, and I, that kind of hit me kind of hard, and I thought it was appropriate to share with you all today. Um, kind of similar to what my parents said, I brought you in this world and I can take you out. But, uh, not exactly the same, but County Executive Steve Shue wants to make Anne Arundel County the best place to live, work, and start a business in Maryland, and, and that certainly applies to seniors as well. So we're committed to using the great network we have here in this county, connected to the state and national uh, departments of aging and disabilities, to, to make sure that you all can take charge of your health care, that you have access to recreational programs and social activities, and access to life support and treatment. You know, it's something that's real important. And as Pam said, we have the number of seniors doubling in this county, so we're doubling our efforts. So again, thank you all, and I hope you enjoy the day, and I'll be out here, and feel free to talk to me about, uh, you know, the weather, my favorite color, anything, anything you guys want to talk about. I'll be hanging out. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Pam, for those remarks. Um, our first guest speaker today was appointed to her position by Governor Hogan earlier this year, and she hit the ground running and with passion, I believe. Um, she currently serves on several committees um, at just a few of her responsibilities to include the Interagency Committee on Aging Services, the Oversight Committee on Quality <coughs> Care in Nursing Homes and Assisted Living Facilities, the Interagency Disability Board, and the Veterans um, Maryland Veterans Trust. Please join me in welcoming the Maryland Department on Aging Secretary, the Honorable Rona Kramer.
thank you very much. It's hard to believe I could get anything done with all those committees and commissions that I'm serving on. Um, first, I'd like to say that I think every morning should begin with music like Tim's. And, uh, and maybe we should say the hell with the speeches and just dance. For Amen. Amen. There's a lot of enthusiasm for that. Um, let me give you a little bit, if I could, of my background. Um, I uh, come from the business community. I manage shopping centers. I have my own small business that I've operated for 30 years. And um, had spent eight years in the Maryland Senate and had, uh, had some interaction with the uh, area agencies on aging through the funding part of that. I was on the Budget and Taxation Committee. Uh, but um, so when Governor Hogan called and asked if I would consider serving in his cabinet, uh, it was thought because my background was business and financial, uh, in dealing with financial issues, that uh, something sort of financially oriented would be considered. I asked the governor uh, if he would consider, uh, if I served in the cabinet, uh, if he would consider appointing me to the Department of Aging. And I think I can think of nothing more important uh, in society than assisting and taking care of those people who have done everything for us, uh, who have educated us and taken care of us and loved us and uh, and now it's our opportunity and I think a wonderful opportunity to uh, provide opportunities to provide ways to keep our seniors from having to move into nursing facilities. If we were to boil down into one sentence what it is that the that is the job of the Department of Aging. It is to prevent our seniors from having to live in nursing facilities and provide every type of service that we can to either allow people to age in place, to have uh, assisted living, great social activities, and, uh, and make life <coughs> wonderful. Um, I can, everyone has been concerned about budget cuts. Uh, and we did come into uh, office, this administration, with budget issues to deal with. I can tell you that every department was asked to cut their budget, their 2015 budget, by 2%. And when I sat down and looked at our budget, uh, that 2% would have had to come in large part out of programming. Uh, we have, in the Maryland Department of Aging, reduced our expenditures administratively. We have cut way back on our spending to avoid having program spending cuts. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, I sat down with the governor and the governor's staff, and we determined that we would not be taking a, two, a full 2% cut out of the Department of Aging because so much of it would have had to come out of program. So the state government is finding other places to take those cuts. We took small cuts, relatively small, out of a couple of the programs that we have, and that was it for 2015. Uh, we will are now working on our 2016 budget and any reductions that we can make, but we are asking our partners, our area agencies on aging, to make small cuts um, but out of administration, if at all possible, as we will continue to do at my department. I can tell you in my great 90 days of experience here that um, Anne Arundel County's Area Agency on Aging is very, very well respected throughout the state. Thank you. They do an absolutely wonderful job here, and it is recognized uh, by my staff and by other people providing the same services uh, all the way uh, across the state of Maryland. Uh, if I could take a moment, I would like to just give you an update on what's happening in Baltimore City. As all of you know, um, 
the uh, destruction in the city uh, has created a huge amount of um, stress for our partners in the city and for our senior citizens living in the city. Uh, we, uh, a number of the senior centers have been closed. Those senior centers are very much depended on to provide meals in addition to other services. And without those meals, uh, people would be going hungry. So uh, our department and the uh, very much the Area Agency on Aging in Baltimore City jumped in immediately to start delivering meals. Not an easy process given the fact that some of our trucks that were delivering the meals were having trouble getting through police lines. So um, it took some coordination. It's been done and they've done a wonderful job, but now we have an ongoing issue of having the grocery stores and the um, uh, pharmacies for a huge part of the senior population in the city gone. They will be gone for quite some time. There's no telling when some of these burned out businesses will come back. And so we have arranged for transportation to pick up seniors where they live and take them to other facilities that are a distance away. So um, we're working on it. It has taken um, a, a lot of scrambling, but, uh, but very successfully. And hopefully, everyone will, will be properly cared for. Um, I think they are. I, I believe we've made that. Um, my vision for the future I've been asked to share, and when it comes to the future for aging, <clears throat> it was mentioned that we've got a, a burgeoning senior population. That's a wonderful thing, because I'm in that group that's the, <clears throat> the big uh, baby boomer group coming along. But, um, and given that, we know that we are going to have to make some changes to what we're doing. We've, we're going to have limited budgets. We don't see our budgets increasing. And yet we've got so many more people to serve. And it seems logical to me that the only way we're going to be able to make those two facts mesh is to start keeping people healthier. We've got to provide whatever it takes to keep people healthy so that in the future they need fewer of our services to age well at home. And uh, it is, uh, I look forward to hearing from and working with experts that we have here as well as those of you in the community uh, and learning and hearing thoughts because we're going to have to make some big changes and I look forward to doing that with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Secretary Kramer. Good to see you today. Um, our keynote speaker we're really honored to have with us today. She has more than 30 years experience in the development and delivery of aging, health, human services, transportation, and housing programs all over the nation. She's here to share with us the history of the Older Americans Act and its impact on aging today. It's my pleasure to introduce to you the CEO of the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, Sandy Markwood. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right, now I think I'm going to have some assistance and somebody's going to help me with technology because I have issues with it. <laughs> I agree with Rona. I have, uh, I want to thank you for inviting me here today. Beautiful day, incredible facility, wonderful people, wonderful <laughs> celebration of the Older Americans Act. But I tell you, Tim just got me going. Yeah. I'm feeling good and hopefully you are too. And this morning what I wanted to do is to be able to talk with you, and let me get this on the right um, slideshow start. Here we go. Is I wanna get you into the act. You're already into the act. Um, we have a lot to celebrate with the Older Americans Act, but the beauty of the Older Americans Act is the fact that it is a commitment 
on the part of the federal government to ensuring that people can age successfully in place, but it's also a commitment of individuals and communities to make that work. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that. But before we get into the Older Americans Act, I just want to go back 50 years. Now some of you in the room can remember back to 1965, I can. Um, and, and I just wanted to give the context for when this act was passed. Now from a front perspective, <clears throat> Okay, we remember the Beatles. We remember, you know, the, the top movie in 1965 was Dr. Zhivago. Hogan's Heroes out there as one of the top TV shows. And look at the kind of cars we were driving then. Kind of funky, huh? Um, look what we were wearing then. Oh my goodness. Um, and, you know, and, uh, and how many people remember sitting under a hair dryer? Come on, ladies, admit it. How about Tony Perms? Do you remember that? I had them. Um, they were, my, mine were really bad, those home perms. And guys, the leisure suits, you know, you, you had it going too, you know. So and when we look at that, and we look back on the predictions that people were making in 1965, this is a, a cartoon. By 1986, much of the world's food will be synthetic, factory made, and by, 20, by 2006, you may telephone your vote to a capital computer on every law. <laughs> Okay, predictions. So there were a lot of, the, when we look at fashion, when we look at cars, there were a lot of fun things going on back in 1965, but there were a lot of serious things going on in 65 too. You know, we did have issues uh, with the civil rights movement. We also had issues with uh, wars. We also had issues with poverty. And that's really why Lyndon Johnson developed his whole War on Poverty program that the Older Americans Act was part of. And as we talked about the Older Americans Act, you know, again, if we go back to 1965 when this act was passed, at that point, over 30% of people who were seniors, older adults, were living in poverty. And that, the condition of older adults in this country really called us to do a national action to be able to say, that we really wanted to commit to honoring people as they age, that we wanted to really commit to ensuring that people could live where they wanted to, which is at home and in their communities for as long as possible. So July 14th, 1965, Lyndon Johnson passed the Older Americans Act, which was passed just weeks away from Medicare and Medicaid. So it was really part of an overall federal commitment to ensuring that people could age well and age with health care, which was part of Medicare and also Medicaid. But the Older Americans Act was passed first. But this is the interesting thing. The Older Americans was passed on and funded on one side of the budget, the discretionary side of the budget. And Medicare and Medicaid were passed on the mandatory side of the budget. Basically, in DC um, appropriations talk, that means that as the demand goes up, Medicare and Medicaid funding goes up. There's discussions on that as well. But for the Older Americans Act, being on the discretionary side of the budget, we had to fight every year for funding for that program. And so as I go on in the presentation, you'll see that there's a little bit of a discrepancy on where the Older Americans Act is as far as the federal investment right now. But what we know and what you've heard is, you know, the, eight, the population is growing older. Um, it's growing, it's going to double here in this county. And in, when we look across the nation, I also always want to look not just at the population of people who are at any marker for what we call old. As I will be eligible for Older Americans Act services in August, I keep pushing old to another level, right? How about you guys, you know? Usually when I walk into talking to, um, to groups of people my age and maybe a little older and we, I go, well, what do you call old? And you know, it's not until you get into your 90s or 100 that people go, well, maybe that's old, maybe that's old. But in any event, I think, you know, the fact is that as a nation we're growing older and I believe that that is something that we should celebrate. In addition to celebrating the Older Americans Act, the fact that the nation is getting older is a wonderful thing that we have a longevity revolution in this nation. But there's also some things that we need to recognize is that as we grow older, not happening to everybody, but at some point, you need some assistance to be able to live successfully at home and in the community. And that's what the Older Americans Act 
gives us the opportunity to provide services to meet those needs. But over time, since 1965 to today, there's been an awful lot of other changes. Now, we've got, so when we're talking about older adults, we're not just talking about one generation of older adults, we're talking about multiple generations. And, you know, this may be funny, but it's true. The, the Rolling Stones, the average age of the Rolling Stones is older than the U.S. Supreme Court justices. Can you believe that? Um, and, but then we're also serving people, so we've got multiple generations of baby boomers, much less multiple generations of the silent generation, and, and there will be new generations of older adults. So we need to meet the needs of people in their generation, in the, in the setting that they want to, uh, to live in, and that is, as we know, in their homes and communities. But the other great thing is we've got a more diverse population of older adults than we ever have in this country. Again, something to be celebrated. But when we look at the Older Americans Act, the key here is that that act has been dynamic and changed since it was passed in 1965. This is just a diagram that shows a timeline of all of the different additions to the act. So it started out as a national commitment, and then as people saw the needs of older adults, it grew. We added the nutrition program. We added uh, programs that created senior centers. We added elder rights. We added the National Family Caregiver Support Program. So ever since that act was passed, it's been dynamic and it's changed. And as you heard, the Anne Arundel Area Agency on Aging since its beginning has changed and grown and expanded as well to meet the needs of older adults here in this community. But again, what hasn't changed is the mission. The mission of what this agency does and what area agencies, and I would say state offices on aging across the country are committed to, which is to ensuring that older adults, people with disabilities, and also to support their caregivers so that people can live at home and in their community for as long as possible. So that's, that's what we do. That's what this aging, National Aging Network does, and that is what the Inner Rundle Department on Aging and Disability Services does, and does it very, very well. So the scope of aging services has grown and expanded. Um, and when we look at the numbers of people served here in this community and across the country, it is amazing the millions of people who rely on the services of the Older Americans Act to be able to age and to be healthy and to age successfully in their community. But in looking at that throughout this 40 years of area agencies on aging, because area agencies on aging were created 10 years after the Older Americans Act. As you heard, there were commissions on aging, but then the formal area agencies on aging were actually created in 1973, and some were created uh, two years later, 1975. But throughout this history, 40 years, 50 years, the aging network has been able to touch the lives of millions, millions of older adults, people with disabilities more and more, and their caregivers. And we've done it, and we've done it really well. These are just national statistics about the touch, the reach of the aging network every year, serving millions of people with information and caregivers who need that support to help them care even longer for their loved ones. People who are getting rides to the doctor, to the pharmacy, to the grocery store, meals, as Rona was talking about how critical that is to so many people to be able to age successfully, and also homemaker and personal care services. This aging network in the 40 and 50 years that it has been in place has done incredible, incredibly good works that have served so many people. But, as you heard, the numbers of aging individuals in this community across the country is growing. But what hasn't necessarily kept up with the pace of the rising and aging population is that federal investment in the Older Americans Act. And I just wanted to point out some of the, some of the stark differences that we've got here. If we looked at the investment in the Older Americans Act in 1980 versus 2010, in 1980 um, it was at about $9.24 for somebody 65 plus, 2010 down to $3.85. And if we looked in 2014, it would probably be even lower, closing, um, closing in on a $3 figure. So when we look at this, we recognize that the federal investment is there in the Older Americans Act. But because of the budget situation we have nationally, 
And you also heard from Roman, you have a, a situation on the state on the state level as well. It is very, very difficult to be able to ensure that the services that people are need are available in this community and across the nation. And this is just another chart that shows that a little bit differently. These are statistics from 2005 to 2009. Um, and it shows the purple line on the bottom is the amount of people who can be served by the Older Americans Act. The green is people who are at 200% of uh, the federal poverty level, blue 250% of the federal poverty level. And then that orange is the number of people who, if we were able to really meet the needs of individuals, um, would be eligible for Older Americans Act services, but really aren't being able to be served because of the limitations in the dollars. So really, when we look at the Older Americans Act, a beautiful piece of legislation that has a whole range of services that you and your family and friends and neighbors may need at some point or are using now, but what we need to make sure is that there's going to be support for those services um, as people need them over time. And this really goes back to what Ronnie was saying, because we know that older adults, we know that caregivers want to serve people at home and in their community. Every survey that's out there says that that's where people want to age. When you walk into a room and you say, how many people want to go to a nursing home? Very few people raise their hand. But in saying that, there is a place for nursing home care if you need that level of support. Absolutely. But if you can get by with just a few services, People would rather age at home, and that's what the Area Agency on Aging does, and does it very cost effectively, at one third the cost or less of nursing home care. So when we look at where we've been and where we're going, I really think aging in this nation is at a crossroads. It's at a crossroads because the population is growing and growing and growing. And again, I believe that's a tremendous thing. I think it's something that we should all celebrate. But I also think that there are challenges in the funding that are out there. We need to tackle that head on and, and deal with those. And part of that is whether there's increased funding. The other part of it is, is to make sure that the funding that we have at the state and federal level is being used and directed to all populations. So we're really looking at supporting people across their lifespan, which includes people um, in the latter years of life. So in looking at that, I believe that there are challenges, but there are huge opportunities for aging here in this community and across the country. And I just wanted to highlight some of them. But when we're talking about highlighting changes, I have to say that sometimes people will say, meeting the challenges of aging is in the future is going to require change. And change is the law of life, and those who look only at the past or the present are certain to miss the future. That's a quote from John Kennedy. And we have a great past to celebrate, and we have a great, great present to celebrate, but we really want to focus in on is the future, the future of aging. So another way of looking at this, this is a quote that I can resonate with a little bit more, Will Rogers, even if you're on the right track, you get run over if you just sit there. Um, in saying that, I believe aging services here in this community and across the nation have been on the right track. Remember I showed you how many millions of people we've been able to serve. That's wonderful. That's great. But, you know, right now when we look forward at trying to meet the challenges of aging, we can't bury our heads in the sand. We have to take these challenges on head first. Now, if this was back and I was doing this presentation in February, I would have said this was snow. But since it's May, I'm going to say it's sand. Um, because the reality of our time is that change is difficult, but not changing is fatal. And so as an aging network, we need to celebrate where we've been, but we need to forge the future of aging. And that may require us to do some changes. But again, as I said, we've changed all along. When we're looking at just in the time that I've been at the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, I came in 2002, these are some of the things that this area agency and area agencies across the country have tackled head on. The National Family Caregiver Support Program was rolled out with the 2000 amendments to the Older Americans Act. Signing up for Medicare Part D, that happened in the past 10 years and was a huge opportunity for area agencies to touch and serve more people. Focus on person-centered services, meeting the needs of people and, and providing services where they are and the services that they want. 
aging and disability resource centers, which you have here, being able to serve people who are older, but also recognizing there's synergy between people who have disabilities as well, which really has led area agencies to serve a broader base of the population. Older adults, people, more and more people with disabilities. Nationally, over 70% of area agencies serve people with disabilities or chronic diseases of all ages, and again, they're caregivers. But also key, and this is a point that Rona made, is serving people um, and trying to make them healthier through providing evidence-based programs like fall prevention programs that help people remain and, and sustain their balance so that they don't fall. Do you know that falls is the number one injury, fatal injury of people who are older? We, we can prevent falls. Um, there are evidence-based programs out there that can help people prevent falls, but also managing chronic conditions. There are tons of programs that have been proven to be able to help people age successfully, age more healthily, and those are being provided through area agencies on aging. And this last point, planning for a livable community, which I really want to um, highlight the work of the state and area agencies here. What do I mean by livable community for all ages or lifetime community? It's making sure that you have transportation and housing and recreation and land use patterns that support people, not just when they're young, but support people across their lifespan to make sure, as it is, that Anne Arundel County is a good place to grow up, but a great place to grow old. So providing aging services sometimes, I know that the staff here at the area agency sometimes feels like this cart in the mule. There's lots of things going on and sometimes not enough funding to be able to make it all come together and work. But I really think from my perspective, the future of aging is bright and it's one that we need to gallop off in the future and grab. And I just wanted to highlight to you some of the options and opportunities that I see. One is I see the future of aging and area agencies on aging and the work of, uh, that's going on within this agency and all the others in the state as bridging the gap between the acute care world of medical health and what happens in your home. Where does health happen? Does it happen in the hospital? Does it happen in the doctor's office? No, it happens in your home. It happens in your community. And the area agency on aging has the ability to help you in your home and in your community and to be able to ensure that you can make that transition if you're in a hospital back into your home. Because what we found out is that, five, oh, that, that over five million Medicare beneficiaries were going back into the hospital for preventable hospital readmissions. Preventable. You know why? It wasn't because of medical care. 40 to 50 percent of those or more were because people, when they got home from the hospital, didn't have food in the refrigerator or what food was in there had spoiled while they were in the hospital. They didn't have a ride back to their follow-up doctor's appointment. They came home with a bag of medicine and they didn't know how to take those in addition to all of the medicine that they had at home. It's that services and supports at home in the community. I think this is a huge opportunity for area agencies on aging. Also focusing in on those evidence-based health promotion programs. I agree with Rona. We need to make sure if there's a silver bullet for aging, it's being able to maintain your health as long as possible. And if you have a chronic condition or other illnesses, is to be able to manage those at home and in the community. And I believe area agencies on aging are doing, over 90% are already doing evidence-based programs. Assessments and care management. Being able to assess your needs and to be able to come up with a whole package of services and programs, some provided through the area agency, some provided by private sector entities in your community, but being able to assess what your needs are and to help you manage those, <coughs> and also being a focal point for home care for people of all ages, because again, we're already expanding into serving older adults, people with disabilities, and their caregivers who need support as well, and also promoting livable communities. So I said the aging network is changing. Already, when we look at the area agencies on aging, traditionally across the country, only 35 to 40 percent of their budgets come from the Older Americans Act. But the Older Americans Act remains the foundation of everything that they do. Over time, area agencies are serving people with disabilities of all ages, and, and again, providing those critical health programs, those evidence-based health programs, over 90 percent. 
And also, more and more area agencies are working with healthcare providers. Again, health is key and critical and how can we help people age in a healthy way in their homes. But one way that they're doing this, which is why I am so excited about Rona's background, is they're moving more and more into establishing more business acumen in how we are doing the work that we do. Um, it's a new age in being able to manage uh, a limited amount of funding and serve uh, more individuals with that funding and to do that well. So what we're moving into is a, is a new realm of business opportunities, and I say business, not changing the mission, but how do we be able to provide more and more services um, to older adults in this community and across the country, and to do that as in a lean way with limited funding. And to be able to do that, what we're looking at is area agencies on aging not changing their mission, but be able to expand their work in the community and doing what they do best through partnerships with insurance companies, medical communities, and other employers in the community who may want to get the services that area agencies are providing. And looking at establishing new ways to be able to price and fund those services. And that is a challenge, I know, especially for area agencies that are housed in um, county governments or in councils of governments. I worked for over 20 years for the National Association of Counties, so I know that governmental um, structure issue all too well. But I think the other part of it is just looking at how can we take the best of what we've done and to be able to ramp it up to meet the challenges of the future. So if I was out there saying, what do I think the future of aging services will be? I believe the Older Americans Act will always be there because it needs to be, because it's a beautiful piece of legislation that's been the foundation of aging services in this country. But in saying that, I think that it will never be funded at the level that it needs to be to meet all of the demands. And part of that is that we also need to leverage Older Americans Act services and supports in different ways. But I also see a trend across the country in more and more area agencies contracting for funding with other payers. Um, whether it be insurance companies who want to buy home and community-based services, and there's a 40-year history here, they can go build it or they can, they can purchase those services through contracts with area agencies. And the same with accountable care organizations, but also private businesses. What we're seeing is area agencies on aging providing the wellness services for many private businesses um, because they do it and they, they do it really well and also moving more in partnership with providers in the private sector, a public-private partnership, moving into private pay. An example of this in Virginia is Fairfax County that has a partnership with the Inova Healthcare System, and they go in and if somebody needs services or supports her, they do an assessment in partnership with the hospital, but you have to pay for it on a sliding scale fee. Because the reality is we're not going to be able to meet everybody's needs with the funding that we have. So as we look towards the future, I would say that more and more individuals, families, and communities are going to need to plan to meet the needs. And that means that we're all going to have to take responsibility to do that. But communities are going to have to work more and more with community stakeholders and service providers to make that happen. We are all in this together to be able to make this work. And we're going to need to work with our policymakers to make sure that if there are additional funds that are targeted well, and if we need to look at the funds that are in place now, that they're being used um, well. And that when we're looking at transportation and aging, that there may be funding in the transportation budget or housing and aging. There may be funding in the housing budget that then could be dedicated to serving a, a growing older population. But in looking at this, the one thing about the Older Americans Act, which sets it apart from other pieces of federal legislation, is it requires the Area Agency on Aging to be an advocate for you, for older adults. It also requires you to be an advocate for yourself as well. So we need to be loud advocates for what the needs of older adults, people with disabilities, and caregivers are in this community. And if I looked at this community with the growing numbers of older adults, and I added the percentage of people in this community who are over, oh, 65, 75, you pick the marker. But also add in the number of people who are caregivers for older adults here in this community. How many, what percentage of the population in Anne Arundel County do you think that would be? 
And how powerful is that when you're looking at making decisions in this community to meet the needs of people as they age? So advocating is key and critical. And advocating for what is going to be needed um, for this generation of older adults, but as importantly for the future. And in saying that, there are federal advocacy opportunities, Older Americans Act, up for reauthorization. We need your support to be able to get that through the finish line. 50th anniversary of the Older Americans Act this summer. White House Conference on Aging this summer. Wouldn't it be great to get that act passed? As well as funding for Older Americans Act so that we can raise that bar and not just have a flat line of uh, how much money goes in to support the critical aging services. <coughs> and also looking at there will be entitlement discussions around Medicare and Medicaid. Your voices are going to need to be heard. At the state and local level, your voices need to be heard um, through the work that you do, helping, uh, helping the state department on aging and also helping the legislature understand the critical needs of this population. And you've got such a great advocate. The fact that you didn't get that 2% cut was huge. And it was because of the advocacy of, of Rona and also because your state legislatures understood the importance of aging issues. Keep that up. It's key and important to your future. But also making sure that that translates to the county executive and all of your county officials to make sure that they understand too that it, sometimes it's not just a matter of more getting new money, sometimes it's how can you use the money that you have. There are some counties across the country that are by, by a mandate of the county executive or the board of county commissioners are requiring that all the departments in that county report back during the budget cycle of what they've done for people who are younger what they've done for people in their middle years, but what have this department done for people who are aging? That's key and critical. It's a different lens for looking at county services. But aging, if it's not your issue now, it will be if you're lucky. And remind people of that, because I divide the world into two groups. Those people who see themselves as older and those people who hope they will live long enough to be older. Two groups. So which group do, does everybody want to be in? And in saying that, when we look at the world that we live in, when we look at our community, we want to make sure that it's a good place to grow up and to grow old. And the Area Agency on Aging helps that be the case. So as we gear up for the next 40 years of the Area Agency, 50 years of the Older Americans Act, we need to make sure that we look forward to meeting the needs of all older adults, more and more people with disabilities and their caregivers, recognizing the diversity of the populations that we're going to need to serve, but most importantly, recognizing our mission and commitment, which is to ensure that people can age here in Anne Arundel County with dignity and independence and live in their homes and communities for as long as possible. And why do we do this? Because today's and tomorrow's older adults are counting on all of us to make sure that we do and that we do it well. Thank you so much. So thank you so much. Um, we appreciate your dedication to advocating and educating the community on the importance of aging issues and aging in communities. So thanks for taking the time to be with us today. Um, Pam, if you would join me up here. Um, the AAA Advisory Council and the Department of Aging um, would really like to thank you for taking your time to share this event with us today. I just want to thank also our sponsors. Um, before we close, we have some sponsors that please visit um, as you um, join us in the next room who have sponsored this beautiful facility for us today. Um, we have the Board of Elections is out in the lobby. Isn't that happy for having Anybody? Our volunteers, our staff, our area agency, a round of applause for everybody. So at this time, I would um, like to introduce um, a very special member of our staff to the stage. Jennifer Jackson, could you please join me on the stage?
Hi, we are at the Chesapeake Art Center in Brooklyn Park, and I have Rona Kramer here with me. Thank you for joining us today, Rona. And um, can you tell us a little bit about what you spoke about today? The importance of the services that we're providing to our senior citizens. Uh, it is extremely important to take care of those people who have taken care of us. Our population of seniors is growing tremendously and uh, we have more to do and more to accomplish with the same number of dollars and that's going to be tough to do in the future but uh, it can be done I think what we need to do is focus on keeping our citizens healthy so that it takes less money to provide the services necessary to keep seniors in the population and at home Yes, that is so important. And what would you like our viewers to take away from your presentation today? I'd like everybody to take some time and think about their health and managing the chronic diseases that they have and not sitting as much as we tend to do and to standing up in com during commercials while you're watching TV and maybe even doing some squats and uh, that will help all of us in the future and help us to better serve our seniors when we get to that point. That sounds great. Thank you, Rona. Hi, we are at the Chesapeake Arts Center in Brooklyn Park, and I have Sandy Markwood with me. Sandy, thank you for joining us. And can you tell us a little bit about what your presentation was about today? Sure. I was talking to the group about celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Older Americans Act, which was passed in July of 1965, and looking at all the wonderful things that have been done since then, and here in this community to serve people to ensure that they can age successfully but also looking forward to what the future of aging is going to be as the population here in Anne Arundel County doubles and looking at how we're going to meet the needs of a growing older population here and across the country. That's wonderful. Thank you. And what would you like our viewers to take away from this presentation today? Well, when we look at our community to make sure that our communities meet the needs of people across the lifespan and, and looking at even if you're not older now, hopefully you will be and making sure that you advocate for a community that meets the needs of people as they're young but also as they're old. Thank you so much, Sandy.